And that's my battle. My battle is to combat that intuition. That for a claim to knowledge, for reason enough to accept the thing is true, what you need is absolute infallible proof. What's wrong with that idea? Well, there are two things that are wrong with it. First of all, even theoretically, what's wrong with it is that we don't have absolute proof for anything. If absolute proof is your standard, then you don't know anything. Let's consider some examples. Do you know who your parents are? How do you know? They told you. And you trusted them. How quaint. Couldn't it be? Isn't it possible that they're, let's not say lying, but they're not, they're misleading you. They're not sharing with you the entire truth that you are in fact adopted. Now you say, no, 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 that's not possible. I look like my parents. Well, the, the reason you look like your parents is because when they went to the adoption agency, they took their baby pictures with them. And they picked out a baby that looked like their baby pictures. And that's why you look like them. So you say, well, I did a DNA test. Now, first of all, I know that you did not do a DNA test. And second of all, even if you did a DNA test, how would you know for sure that your parent, or maybe now I should say those people, those people didn't pay <laughs> off the lab to lie to you about the results? Could you have absolute, infallible, certain proof that they're your parents? Don't think so. But then, on the other hand, I don't think you should stop honoring them, treat them as strangers, give up on it, because we don't wait for absolute certainty to make up our minds what's true. Um, where did people get started with this idea that you need absolute certainty? Descartes is one of the, the one who made it famous. Can you prove that at this very moment you're not sleeping and dreaming? Can you prove that at this very moment what you're experiencing isn't a dream? What should you do? Pinch yourself? Couldn't you pinch yourself in a dream and feel the pain? Well, Descartes said, if you can't prove that you're not dreaming, then you don't know anything at all. Listen carefully to the vocabulary. It might all be a dream. It's possible, isn't it? Let's say we agree to that. Yeah, it's possible. Descartes says, then since it's possible, since you haven't ruled it out absolutely with a proof, you don't know that it's not true. That's where I stick. The fact that it's merely possible, the fact that I haven't ruled it out absolutely, doesn't mean I'm forbidden to conclude that, it's, that the world really exists. It just means I shouldn't use that as a criterion. Why should I wait for absolute certainty, absolute infallibility? Why isn't a lot of evidence short of absolute proof and absolute certainty enough to conclude that it's true, justifiably concludes that it's true, just like you are justified in thinking that those people are your parents? Here's an example from Bertrand Russell. You know there are controversies about the age of the universe. Maybe someday we'll go into them. But here's one you may not be aware of. Can you prove the universe is more than five minutes old? Five minutes so you say, I remember what happened, what happened yesterday. Yeah, but the suggestion is that you came into existence five minutes ago with your brain already programmed with the, what we should now call pseudo-knowledge of what happened yesterday. All the configurations and organization of the brain, which you call your knowledge, came into existence five minutes ago. And you can see how the argument will go. But I have a, a disc with an hour's concert of the Grateful Dead. Couldn't that disc have come into existence five minutes ago with all of the concert recorded on it? We have radioactive decay, and we have items where there's a certain amount of decay products. We know the half-life of these items. Couldn't the decayed part with the, let's say it's uranium lead, so the lead part and the still radioactive uranium part have come into existence five minutes ago? What can you do to prove absolutely that the universe is older than five minutes. Since Bertrand Russell raised this question over 100 years ago, no one has found uh, an acceptable response. Should you therefore become worried about this? Should you become doubtful about this? Let's see, somebody lent you $100 two weeks ago. Should you pay it back? Do you have an obligation to pay it back? You proved to me there was a two weeks ago, and now I'll pay it back. If there wasn't a two weeks ago, 
I never borrowed it from you. It's just a dream. It all got created five minutes ago. Would that go in court? Would you use that for pro- your promises that you made to other people? Suppose someone used it for his promise he made to you. Would you accept that? Oh, you're absolutely right. I can't prove there was a five, more than five minutes ago. So you're right. You don't have to keep your promise. No one would function that way. That's not how we live our lives. First reason being that it's impossible to have absolute proof. Even in mathematics, my field was philosophy of mathematics. There are disagreements about the axioms. There are disagreements about the logic. Even in logic itself, there are disagreements about certain rules, whether they're, they're acceptable rules or not. Even Descartes, I think, therefore I am. My own existence. Even that can be questioned and was questioned in his own lifetime. Abstractly, there's nothing that is recognized and agreed upon as having been absolutely proved. So that being the case, if you're going to set absolute proof as your criterion, you're setting yourself up at the outset for a negative, a null result. You'll have nothing because you've created an impossible criterion. How are we together so far? Let's insert a little footnote here. I don't know how many of you have read Plato. Okay, so you may read Socrates. Socrates interviews people and he says, you think you know something. Tell me how you know. And he debates with them and traps them into all sorts of difficulties. Socrates presents himself as a know-nothing. I don't know anything. I have no commitments. The only thing I know is that I'm ignorant. Right? That's the start of wisdom is self-knowledge of self-ignorance. I don't know anything, but you say you know. Let's see how you know. And then Socrates examines his reasons for knowing. That's a false picture. Socrates is lying to you. Socrates definitely does have his own claims. His own claims that can be raised for examination and critique. Socrates' commitment is, what are the standards for knowledge? He sets certain standards. You say you know, let's see how you know. And implicitly what he's saying is, let's see if you can meet my standards. One could respond, why do I have to accept your standards? So my argument doesn't accept your standards. Maybe your standards are unrealistic. The skeptic who paints himself as having no commitments, and therefore he's not under critique, the skeptic is lying to you. The skeptic has his own commitments. The commitment is his standard of justification, standard of evidence. And you have every right to say to him, the standard of evidence is inappropriate. That also has to be on the table for discussion. And that's what I'm arguing with now. The standard of absolute proof is something which is, is unrealistic. The first reason is because we never can meet it. The second reason is, that I've already indicated, but I want to make it a, a, a separate matter of, of discussion, is that in practical terms, we never have absolute certainty, and yet we make decisions, we take them seriously, we make them according to what we think is the best choice, we can be criticized for the decisions. We criticize other people for those decisions. And no one says, since there's no absolute proof, it's a free, it's a free game. It makes no difference what you decide. Consider a doctor in the emergency room. Someone's brought in as uh, an accident victim. He's severely injured. Something has to be done. Quick! He has no time for multiple MRIs and putting up the results on the internet to consult with people in Germany or in Australia. He's got to make a decision now. His information is very incomplete. He has what he can see and what he can immediately test directly. Does he know for sure which procedure is the best procedure? No. That doesn't mean he makes his decision blind. Doesn't flip a coin. His training enables him to know that when I see these symptoms, when I see this condition, usually this is the best thing to do. Though, in fact, in some cases it won't be the best thing to do. And you pay him to use his knowledge and his experience to make the best choice given the imperfect imperfect information that he has. In fact, there is a field called decision theory, which if you study philosophy or go into business, you may learn. Decision theory is how to make decisions under uncertainty when you don't know for sure what the facts are. You put probabilities on the facts and you calculate the results of your decisions if this is the fact or if that is the fact, and you use decision rules like the mini-max rule or the maximum rule or the expected utility rule, how to make decisions where you don't know the truth for sure. 
when you make your big life decisions, what profession to go into, uh, whom to marry, where to live, you have no guarantees. I think you know you have no guarantees, especially now with the economy shifting and technology shifting so quickly. You can be trained for a profession 10 years from now, the profession could cease to exist. So you train and you project and then you may have to retrain because it didn't provide continued uh, employment. Marriage, I don't have to tell you that marriage decisions have their fragility. Uh, some marriages don't, uh, don't succeed. So when you decide to get married, you have no guarantee that it will succeed. That doesn't mean you make the decision blind. You share experiences with the person and if you have the opportunity to talk to the person's friends relatives share your ideas with your pe people whom you trust you make the best decision that you can knowing that you don't have absolute proof same is true with all your practical decisions now deciding to accept the Jewish tradition as true means changing one's style of life changing one's activities to a great extent it's to a large extent, a practical decision. And I suggest that the same criterion that you use for making those practical decisions, like getting married or like choosing a profession, should be used here on the basis of having enough evidence, having enough reason, not absolute proof, not absolute certainty, not infallibility. I want to mention to you two common responses to this idea and show you how I would deal with them, and then I'll stop for discussion. I think maybe we'll benefit if this window is open and that window is open. And that way we'll get some fresh air in here. Have to push that lever in at the top on the bottom. That's it. There we go. One response to this idea is, is, is the following. Maybe if I'm making a decision with limited consequences and reversible, maybe then having enough evidence is good enough. Let's call it probability. Looking at the basis of probability is good enough. It's too cold. I can, you, can, you guys want me to close it a little bit? Close, close, close yeah. about halfway. We'll close a little less. Yeah. But if you're talking about a decision like accepting a religious tradition as true, that has gigantic consequences. It's the whole of your life for the rest of your life. Maybe, for such a decision, merely having better evidence isn't good enough. I have options. Maybe the majority of the evidence supports this option, but maybe that's not good enough. Maybe you have to have, well, you can't have 100% probability, but 80% probability, the amount of probability you have should be proportioned to the size of the decision, the size of the consequences of the decision. I think that's a mistake for two reasons. I think it's a mistake in, in the abstract, and I think it's a mistake vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish tradition in particular, and I want to describe to you both, both reasons. Let's see. A big decision with big consequences, should I require a considerably greater probability for such a decision? Let's take a case. George goes to the doctor. He's not feeling well. Doctor does a whole workup, and he calls George into his office. He says, George, I have news for you. Some of it's good, and some of it's bad. The bad news is you're sick. George says, I knew that. <laughs> the way I feel, of course I'm sick. And the doctor says, your symptoms are characteristic of two diseases, A and B. Now, the good news is, for A, we have a surefire cure. And for B, we have a surefire cure. The bad news is that if we do nothing, you're dead in six months. And if you have disease A, and we use the cure for B, you're dead in six months. And if you have disease B, and we use the cure for A, you're dead in six months. And does he have both of them, or is there a question? No, they can, he only has one. And you can't use both cures. So George says, okay, Doc, but you've left out the most important piece of information. According to my symptoms, what is the probability that I have A, and what is the probability that I have B? And the doctor says, that's my bad, last 